Book of Esther. So we're in the third part of a series that we're looking into the book of Esther. And I have to be honest with you, every so often we do this. We do what's called a character study in the Bible. And we look at certain people. We've done it to Gideon. We've done it to Joseph. We've done it, I think we've done it to Moses and Abraham, but I don't know that we've done specific series for them. But I think one of the things that is so fascinating about doing character studies is just how practical you can get with them. Here's the deal. Joseph went through crazy stuff. I mean, he was, he was sold by his brothers, given to Potiphar, thrown into prison, and eventually ro arose to second in command over Egypt. I mean, crazy amount of circumstances. But when you look at the life of Joseph, you can pull some very practical things out from his life. I know that me and you don't typically go through scenarios like this. I mean, nobody that I know, even if their name is, uh, golly, what is his name? Swallowed by a well. Jonah. I had a brain mess there for a minute. Even if their name is Jonah, I don't know anybody that's been swallowed by a well and spit out because they tried to run from God. I just don't know anybody that's experienced that. But yet, when you look at these stories, they're so practical in the way that God used people, even Jonah, because he wanted a whole town or a whole city called Nineveh to repent. And so there's a lot of different practical things. And I don't know anybody that's ever gone to a beauty pageant and won a crown or a, what do you call those things, that sash, and then been crowned as queen over anything. They may be the beauty queen, but they're definitely not queen over an entire empire, for sure, like Esther has gone through. So just very practical things that, that uh, we can pull from these character studies. But I want to start off today a little different. Instead of reviewing everything that we've been over, which we'll get to, I want to ask you a question. The question is going to come up on the screen. When was the last time you really sought God for his intervention? When was the last time that you really sought God for his intervention? I want you to think about this for a minute because I don't think it's something that we do every day. Now, we may pray for protection every day. We may pray over our family. We may pray that God, you know, guide us away from evil and so on. But I don't think it's necessarily every day. These, these are moments where we have fervent prayer. In fact, we may even be fasting during these moments because we're really seeking God for His intervention. These are times where we're asking God to open a door or provide a resource or stop something from happening or make something happen. And if God doesn't come through, things have the possibility of getting extremely difficult, even detrimental. So these are moments when we, when we seek God for His intervention. In fact, I wrote these down. When you do this, one of two things normally happens during this time. God either comes through or God sees you through. Let me just put it a different way. God will either intervene or he won't and he'll see you through this process. When God comes through, we get the desired results and he gets the desired glory. When God sees you through, the results are less than desirable and usually involves some type of pain or trouble. However, it's in times like this where our faith is strengthened and our spiritual maturity increases. I don't like that text. I'm sorry. It's just like hard to read, man. Anyway, y'all following me? It's, these are moments where we're asking God to come through to intervene. And when he doesn't, a lot of times, they, we experience some very hard, difficult moments, all right? There's only been two times that I can think of in my recent last 15 years where I've had to deal with moments like these. One moment was when we started the church. Um, it was weird the way it took place. I had very good talks with my pastor about one day pastoring a church. 
But I didn't expect him out of the blue to call me up in his office one Sunday after service was over and say, I think it's time for you to go. And automatically, I went into kind of like, okay, God, this has been fun, but now it's real, you know. And I started seeking God for his intervention. Well, over the next year, it was a crazy whirlwind of God showing up in different ways. But a lot of things that he provided was just, you could tell it was just God seeing me through that time. Another time is when Blaze was born. We were, Melanie and I were seeking God for a child. And the truth is, is that it's different for me than what it was for Melanie. See, it was eight years of, of trying that we went through where God saw her through that time. But there was one time when I prayed over her and I asked God to provide for this child and God intervened. So it may be different for different people. Because if you were to ask Melanie about the time that we started the church, she's probably going to tell you that God just intervened in this situation and that we really wasn't, you know, in a moment of really having to seek God for him, him seeing us through that situation. But it was different in my life. So it may be different in different people's life about how you experience these things. But the, but the point is, is that there are moments that we go through that where we, where we put time aside and we really see God for His direction and, and what He wants. And there are times even when we say, God, you've got to come through in this moment. Otherwise, it's very possible that this could happen or this could happen or this could happen. Today, we're going to focus on the first one. We're going to focus on whenever God actually intervenes. We have been in this story of Esther, and that's what really today is about about God intervening, just to kind of give you a recap on this awesome, dramatic story. Um, Xerxes was the king. It was during the Persian Empire. He threw a party for how many days? 108 days. Now, listen, I've been to some parties in my past, but I've never been to a party that's lasted 108 days. But this king had plenty of wealth, so he threw a party for 108 days. And, and that was just for his leadership. Then he came back for the normal people and threw a seven-day party. And on the seven-day party, he was drunk and feeling really good. And he wanted to show off his queen. So he asked his people to go get his queen. His queen didn't come, disobeyed the order of the king. They were like, we can't have that because we don't want all the other wives. Different error here. We don't want all the other wives disobeying their husbands. So we need to come up with some kind of situation. So they actually deposed Queen Vashti. And then made her, banished her from the kingdom forever out of King Xerxes' sight. But then they came up with this idea that was appealing to the king for many different reasons. That maybe we should hold this beauty contest with all the young virgins in the land. And then whoever comes before the king that pleases the king, we could actually crown her queen. So by decree, Esther had to kind of participate in this search for the next queen. Esther was an orphan. Her parents died. She was being raised by her uncle Mordecai. And so she begins to participate in this. Now, there's a backstory that's happening during all this other stuff. And the backstory is, is that Mordecai gets hired by the palace and becomes a palace guard. But during this time, there's two people that are standing at the gate that start plotting to overthrow King Xerxes. Mordecai uncovers this plot, uses Esther to tell the king... And then because of some leadership shakeup during this time by, the time, by the way, those two guys that were plotting that were impaled on poles, something that we don't do anymore, but I imagine was pretty gross in those days. However, Mordecai, through this leadership shakeup, this guy named Haman becomes in charge. Now, this guy named Haman was pretty much like second in command over everything and it wasn't just that he was in charge but also by decree of the king everybody had to bow before Haman, Haman to give him respect and this is when Haman found out that Mordecai was a Jew because Mordecai refused to bow to Haman and so because he refused to bow to Haman all these things begin to shape up where Haman begin this plot and this is where we're going to pick up today begin this plot to not only destroy Haman the Jew, but in a Hitler-like annihilation, destroy all the Jews in the entire Persian land. 
So this, let's take a look at this plot real quick that starts off in Esther 3. So in the month of April, during the 12th year of King Xerxes' reign, lots, everybody say lots. This is an important word that's used here, even though we don't think about it very often. Um, I'll go in a little bit of detail about what these lots are and how they were cast and everything. But lots were cast in Haman's presence. The lots were called Purim. Everybody say Purim. Try to say that five times. Purim. Okay, just once is good. Anyway, Purim is, and you can say this with an accent, but, but Purim is still a tradition that the Jews do today, um, and they call it Purim, but actually Purim means lots. So I'm, I'm going to get into this during our fifth week of this series. Uh, I don't want to go too much into to it now, but these lots were called Purim. Uh, to determine the best day and month to take action. And the day selected was March 7th, nearly a year later. So these lots were cast on what day we should destroy the Jews on, Haman's thinking. The day actually fell a year later. So this is where we're at. Then Haman approached King Xerxes and said, There is a certain race of people scattered throughout all the providence of your empire who keep to themselves. And they're separate from everyone else. Their laws are different from, the, from those of any other people. And they refuse to obey the laws of the king. So, it is not in the king's interest to let them live. If it please the king, issue a decree that they be destroyed. And I will give 10,000 large sacks of silver to the government administrators to be dis, uh, disposed any at any at, to be deposited into the royal treasure number 10 the king agreed confirming his decision by removing his signet ring from his finger and giving it to Haman the son of Hamadatha and the Agadite the enemy of the Jews in fact Haman many times in this scripture the bible calls Haman the enemy of the Jews the king said the money uh, the, the king said the money and the people are both yours to do as you see fit so i want you to kind of get this because this is again these stories kind of take place and it's so it's so easy to step back from these stories and just go wow you know this seems so fairy tale ish all this is happening there's a king there's this there's this guy trying to plot and everything else but this guy named haman approaches the king and in order to determine what day he's going to annihilate the jews on and it wasn't going to be uh, through gas chambers like Hitler did. If you read further in the story, he, th there's, there's messengers that are sent out to all the provinces, and basically everybody in those provinces, it's their responsibility on this day, March 7th, a year from where we're at, it was their responsibility to turn around and kill all the Jews in their land, which actually turns out to be quite different towards the end of this story. But, so Haman cast lots. Now, it's interesting, I did a little research on lots, because everybody knows, everybody, you ever heard the term, you know, seems like I always get the short straw? You know, you ever heard somebody say it before? Or you ever heard a farmer or somebody draw straws before? And you have a lot in your hand, and you basically pull out straws, and whoever gets the shortest straw has the one that ends up with the task. Well, it's basically like casting lots. However, in the Old Testament ways of doing things, the, the Jews used to cast lots. And when they did, it was like their way of letting God determine who should do what. And so when the Jews cast lots in the old days, it was like letting God decide what happens. In fact, when they would go into the temple... There was a lot of responsibilities. People had to bring an offering. Somebody had to clean the altar. Somebody had to prepare this. There was a lot of different responsibilities when it came to sacrifices. So what they would do to cast lots is they would say, everybody put up their hand and pick a number. So let's just say that seven guys were around. You could choose. You could put up one number with your hand. You could put up four numbers. You could put five, three, whatever it was, and then the, the guy that was over in charge of everything would tell a number to the guy sitting next to him, whether it be 33 or 45 or whatever, 
And then they would go around in a circle and they would say, okay, you have five fingers up. They would count five. The other guy had two, six, seven. The other guy had three, eight, nine, ten. And they would keep doing that and go around the circle until the lot fell on a person. And then they would say the lot has fallen on you. You get the responsibility. So I think it was interesting of how they cast lots. The Bible doesn't go into detail of how Haman cast these lots. But it was just this random way of deciding when we're going to annihilate the Jews. So the story moves on, and there's this interesting back and forth that takes place between Esther and Mordecai. The story moves on after the decree goes out into all the provinces and all the things. The Bible says that everybody was confused about the decree. But then Mordecai, he does something that was typical of those days for somebody that lost a person or for somebody that was mourning. He, he tore his clothes, he put on burlap, and he went out into the streets and he was wailing really loud. Esther gets word of this and she sends her servant, um, Hathaf, she sends her servant to go check on him and actually sends her servant with clothes. Now, have you ever wondered at times why things happen? I mean, like I said earlier, there's times where we plan things, and you ever wonder just why things sometimes don't go as you want them to? And it sometimes it's just so irritating. In fact, I wonder why a lot of times things happen. I wonder why people have ear hair. The thing is, is I've never dealt with ear hair before when I was a teenager, but now as I'm older, I don't know what the, what ear hair is for. I wonder, God, I talk to God, this is some of our conversations sometimes. God, why do we have ear hair? Why do we have nose hair? You ever been talking to somebody and been distracted? Some of y'all are laughing already. Because you know, like, why? This wasn't a problem when we were young. But all of a sudden, you have stuff just coming out of everywhere, and it's just like, why do you have to deal with this? Why? I asked God in my study the other day at Starbucks, why is there roaches? There was a star, it was funny, we were, I was at Starbucks studying the day, and a roach ran across the floor, and every lady in the place screamed. And I'm like, dude, it's just a little roach. But why, why do we have roaches? And the thing is, is that I often ask God this, and I often ask God, why at times do you put us through certain issues? And we don't understand why, but the truth is, is that when we go through a lot of things in life, we learn a lot of things. And God has set up Esther simply for this moment. And I want, I want you to look at this back and forth that Esther had with Mordecai. And we're going to start in, verse, in chapter 4, verse 8. Mordecai gave uh, Hathach a copy of the decree, which is Esther's assistant, issued in Susa that called for the death of all the Jews. He asked Hathach to sow it to Esther and explain the situation to her. He also asked Hathach to direct her to go to the king and beg and plead for her people. Esther replies like this, All the king's officials and even people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his scepter. And as it is, I'm going to paraphrase, it's been 30 days since the last time that Esther has been called upon. So Esther has something to be scared about a little bit right now. Why is this going on? What's going on, God? What is this happening right here? Why is this all happening? And why is it that you're calling me to go before the king when it could cost me my life? And it has been 30 days and the king hasn't even said anything to me yet. Hasn't called on me once. Hasn't wanted my attention or anything. So she sends back to Hathach, well, through Hathach to Mordecai, this reply, and actually Mordecai said this. He sent this reply to Esther. Don't think that for a moment, everybody say a moment. That's right. Don't think that for a moment because 
you are in the palace that you will escape when all the other Jews are killed. I like this part. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. But you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps, Esther, you were made queen for just such a time as this. I like these, these verses because there's a couple things I want to share with you. There are times in life where we have to stand up for what's right. And it's not always the easiest thing to do. But sometimes, instead of doing anything, we opt to just stay quiet. And let me tell you something. A lot of times in life, doing nothing is still doing something. A lot of times in life, doing nothing is still doing something. There are times where God puts us in situations where we have to act. And I love Mordecai's optimism here because you can tell that he's a, he's a devout Jew. He's like, you know what? We've seen God rescue the Jews many times before in the past when their adversaries were at their door. And guess what, Esther? If you stay quiet, it's still doing something. Even though you choose to do nothing, you're still choosing to do something. And guess what? God is still going to rescue the Jews. One way or another, God's going to come through. The question is, is what if He puts you in this position for this moment? God will rescue the Jews, but what if He wants to use you, Esther? In fact, what if... It is because of this moment that you became queen. Esther does what we always do. She underestimated her ability to influence the outcome of these events. And that's what we do. Why do we do that? Because we do a quick evaluation of who we are instead of who God is. A lot of times that's what we do. We sit there and we say, well, I'm capable of doing this, this, and this. Or I'm not capable of doing this, this, and this. And we evaluate our own self instead of evaluating God through us. And what if, what if regardless of how little your position is at work, and what if regardless of how small your title is, what if you've been placed in that position for a moment that could arise that could change everything? And you're going to be faced, not necessarily all the time, but you could be faced with the option of speaking up for what is true or staying quiet and doing nothing. And I actually thought because it's Father's Day, I would talk to the dads a little bit here. Dads, the best way for you to influence the future of your daughter or son is for you to be involved and what they're doing. Don't sit back and wait and say that oh, the mother position is more important. They're both equally important. And don't let the mom do all the work, taking the kid everywhere, doing everything. Be involved with what your kids are doing because you can have influence on them. What if you're putting that position to do that? The Bible teaches us in James 1.19 to be quick to listen and slow to speak but it doesn't teach us to avoid evil by pretending it doesn't exist let me say that again the bible in james 1 19 teaches us to be quick to listen and slow to speak some of us need to take that at heart because a lot of times what happens is we always want to do the talking but we listen to other people better listeners we should become better listeners. But it doesn't teach us to avoid evil and pretend like it doesn't exist. Esther obviously is put in a, a scenario here where she's got to do something. I wrote this down. Don't, don't get involved with someone else's drama just because it's around you. But if you see someone that will be hurt unless you say something, then speak up. 
How many times do we see this on the news? We'll see somebody that's getting beat up where somebody else has opted to pull out their phone and record it instead of standing up for the person. The crazy society we live in today with technology. But you see it all the time. Instead of getting involved in the situation, people would rather stand back and record it and watch it happen. Now listen, I'm not telling you to get involved in every scenario. Obviously, this requires discernment. And we're not to go around and get in somebody else's drama just because it's there. But there's a difference between somebody being in an argument or a disagreement between somebody being abused. And there are moments where we'll be put in situations where we have to do something instead of just doing nothing. And these moments a lot of times will come because of your faith. One of the things I've found to be pretty uh, relevant is, is that our faith a lot of times will be tested at work. It will be tested by what we do and the people and the relationships that we have. So there are moments that we will be tested. God's plan will come to pass no matter what, just like Mordecai said. But if we, but what if we were placed, or what if you were placed in a position to be a part of the plan? In other words, this is interesting. I wrote it like this. <laughs> what if God's intervention can depend on your intervention? I put his in there. But what if what if in order to be to intervene in some in, in some in some kind of scenario, what if in order to do that God is waiting for you to intervene? Mordecai obviously said, you know what, Esther? The Jews are going to be taken care of one way or another. But what if you were put into this scenario in order to do that? I think a lot of times in life. God waits for us to do something. And, and it doesn't mean that His plan won't happen. His plan will come to pass. But what if we're put into positions at times, we've got to recognize those and know when to do something. Regardless of your title or lack thereof, God has put you in a position to influence this. Look at what Esther did. Esther said, you know what? Go, go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days and nights. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in and see the king. Even if I must die, I must die. The question is, is that in our life, let's stand as we close. The question is, is that in our life, Are we, are we really being obedient to the point that at times it will make us uncomfortable? It's so easy, man, to go through life and just do what's necessary. I told this story here a while back ago, but there's one of my receivers and it was one of the very first moments that I had met her. I didn't know her from no, nowhere. We've developed a great relationship now. But she started, it was just one of the first moments I met her. She started complaining about her shoulder. And she was like, man, my shoulder's hurting, this and that. It's just hard for me to do anything. And it's just weird. Like in my spirit, I was like, you need to pray for her shoulder. And I didn't know if she was a believer or not, but... I asked her, I was like, you know, you want me to pray for your shoulder? She was like, yeah. I don't know how faithful of a believer she is, but it was just that, it was just that moment of hearing the Holy Spirit say something and then being able to be obedient to it. And I think that there's a lot of times if we're, if we're honest, where I think we miss those moments. It isn't necessarily that we don't hear them, but w w there's times where we would just, just rather opt out to do nothing. And I think that there's moments like these that, 
that's when God changes things in our life. Whenever we hear Him speak directly to us or whenever we get, um, I don't know how to put it, but in, in our spirit, we feel like there's confirmation to do something, but yet we would rather just opt out not doing anything. And it's so easy to do that. It's so easy just to go, I'm comfortable where I'm at. I'm, I, I don't really want to give that. I don't really want to do that. I really don't want to wake up. I really don't want to. There's so many moments that God could change other people's life and your life in those scenarios if we would just be as bold enough as Esther would to say, in other words, God, if you want this, then I'll do it. Let's bow our heads as we close. The question is, is that today, no matter who showed up or who didn't, you might be here for a specific moment. And this moment has the potential to change your life forever. It's a moment where you can dedicate your life to God. You may be here for this moment. And it may change everything in your life. So my question is today is, how's your relationship with the Lord? I challenge you to evaluate that, to do a really good evaluation. And if you are here for this moment, don't let this moment pass without you making a stand. Don't let this moment pass without you saying, God, I understand this is what I've done in the past. This is where I've been. But I realize that you gave your life for me. And not only did you give your life, but you were resurrected. You died on the cross. You rose from the grave. I put my faith in you. And I'm going to tell you something, man. Once you make that decision, your life begins to change. It may not change overnight, but one of the things that you'll see that I just mentioned is that you'll notice that there's a little voice that starts to speak to you when things go wrong. You'll realize, even in the small things like it was with my cussing back when I gave my life to the Lord, God will begin to deal with you about small things. And maybe even one day, a year or two from now, you'll see that He's led you through all this time and provided everything that you need according to His riches and glory. If you haven't made that decision yet, today is the day. You're here for that moment. I can't make it for you. You have to make it yourself. But the Bible does tell, say that when we do that, we need to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and that He died and rose again. And at that moment, we will be saved. Let's pray. Father, I know during this time we've had our eyes closed and our heads bowed, but I pray now that You would do what only You can do and work through a moment like this. I pray that if anybody has been dealing with anything that they need to give up right now, I pray that they would hear that and feel that push and hear that voice from You. Whatever that is, I pray that they would give it up to you, turn it over to you, put it in your hands. If there's anybody that hasn't experienced what it's like to give their heart to you and find salvation and this peace that goes beyond human understanding, I pray, God, that right now that you would just wrap your arms around them and let them know that you love them so much that you died for them and that you're there right now. And the promise is, is that you will never throughout this moment throughout the rest of their life leave them or forsake them i pray that we would be people that hear your voice and like esther even if it takes a sacrifice in our own life and even if we've got to give something up and even if it costs us something and even if it's not fun and not cool and not the right thing to do at the right moment according to somebody else's eyes 
And even if it causes a relationship strife, I pray that we would be that type of people that would hear your voice, do what's right, be obedient the way that Esther was obedient and say, so be it. If it costs me this, it costs me that. But I have to do what the Lord has put on my heart. Use this story of Esther to challenge us when times are tough to know that you're still in control. We may ask why at times, and that's okay. I think through the conversations of asking why, there are moments of surrender. So I just pray, God, that we would be that type of people that understand your word, understand what you desire of us, and not just go through the motions, but instead do the things that are required of us. If anybody surrendered their life to you today for the first time, I thank you, Father, for that life that's come to you. I thank you for an eternity that's changed. And we give all the praise to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap, church. It's through moments like this. What if through a moment like this, things change forever?